Tonight on the Goblin's Corner, Chimeras Part 2, Flying Monstrosity. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblin's Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight, we're doing Chimeras Part 2. Flying monstrosities. Indeed. Yeah. I love making monsters. Sure. And you love making monsters, Matt. It's true. And tonight, we're, we've created some truly epically ridiculous creatures in in some cases ridiculous in some cases awful we are terrible humans oh, some of these are completely destructive and are total party kills if you play them the way that we intend you to play them and some of them are just stupid yes there's definitely one that's ridiculously stupid but yes. that's fine because we've got chimeras and we'll briefly go over what makes a chimera and how to make them better and stuff like that Predominantly, it's all about yeah, just chimeras. Yes. That's it. Chuck a couple of critters into a blender, pour it onto a cookie sheet, bake it, see what comes out. And all of these are flying monstrosities, which means some part of this will be flying creature. Yes. But before we get to all of that... First, we've got a question of the week. All right. So tell me, what is your question of the week this week, Matt? So, you know, I'm trying to keep with my themes. Mm-hmm. The Wicked Witch. I'm familiar with her. My had, dated one. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> had flying monkeys. Yes. What would your iconic flying minion be? Oh. You know me too well, so you know my answer will be flying turtles. It was either going to be flying cats or flying turtles. Or Godzilla with wings. Or Godzilla with wings would be hilarious also. But a little, a little cumbersome. I mean, that would definitely be a flying monstrosity. Yes. Can you imagine Mothra, King Ghidorah, and Godzilla mashed up together? Think about it. That'd be awesome. I'd love that. But no, I would say probably flying turtles would be the most amusing. It'd be Koopa. Sure. Just, yeah. yeah. Alligator snapping turtle. Let my minions go! And they just kind of fly out in a mass and they're all a bunch of turtles. The world needs to know what kind of wings. Hmm. Oh, they'd be the bird wings. <laughs> just like straight up straight, dove wings? Straight just up the, the white dove wings. wings? Oh, yeah, totally. Nice. It totally looked like that. Now, okay. I would also consider flying frogs. Okay. And this could be the bat-winged frogs. Like they, they just sure. majestically leap like this, which would be hilarious. I also thought, <laughs> for some reason, kind of like how spiders make silk from, you know, their abdomens. Yeah. These make parachutes from their butt. And so they just kind of leap Whoa. into the air and fart a parachute and just kind of... It's like a hot air balloon. Yes. But they would be monstrous frogs. Yes. So they would leap out of my flying zeppelin, my magical zeppelin that I am, of course, attacking you in. Right. By the dozens. And just... Yeah, and just kind of fart out a parachute. They'd be like paratroopers. And then they'd land and they would eat the person yeah because frog because frog i mean mr toad we get along right i know so that would be mine now you have one which i find most amusing and i'm gonna say that yours as mine would also be it's another again another trope for us if we want a flying creature what would it be i have two uh -huh. one one is the answer that you are no doubt aware of which is a flying cat of course right but it would have to be talking. Absolutely. So you, like a Tressum, mm -hmm. right? But instead of Tressum sized, if you if you go between Tressum and Griffin, in the middle, I feel like you have a bird cat, a lynx with harpy eagle wings. I could see that. Just giant fluff ball with. Adorable, fluffy murder mittens. That would tear you to shreds. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, it would wreck house. That's no questions asked. Definitely yeah. a murder machine. I like that. <laughs> so I like that one. Mm -hmm. The other one is scavengers. Okay. I want winged thieves. So what we're going to have is hmm. raccoons with giant pigeon wings. Pigeon wings or bat wings? Because a bat winged raccoon would be fearsome. Think about that. Yeah, but, you know, for, for, 
for that scavenger look. You, oh, you want you want the pigeon wings because the scavenger. Because scavenger, type? yeah. I could see that. That would be really cool. Are you the owner of a raccoon, or perhaps you're a scavenger? Write to us info at goblinscorner.com, or you can reach me, Eric at goblinscorner.com, or me, Matt at goblinscorner.com. And of course, you can find us on all the things, and we're always on Twitter. It's true. You want to hit us up at Goblin's Corner on Twitter? We will talk to you. It's true. And if you have questions that you don't want a thousand people to chat with, just send us a DM. We answer those, yeah, too. Hit us up. We yeah. talk to you. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Chimeras tonight, because that is the episode that we're doing. It turns out. Yeah. It turns out. Uh, so first off, what is Chimera, Eric? That's a good question. Well, the traditional Chimera, obviously, is the... What is it, the goat, the dragon, and the lion, lion head? body? Yep. Yeah. What is it, goat head, dragon head, and lion head, right? Yep. Yeah. And some they've got wings, and some they have a snake tail. Yep. And some of them, the hindquarters is eagle versus lion, but basically it's an amalgamation of like three critters yep. that fly. Three to five, yeah. Now, chimera in the modern sense is anything that's been mashed together, like a chimeric creature right. genetically. And some of these chimeras we've created for tonight would work just as well for that as, as also. Yeah. And several of ours are magical chimeras. They are monsters mixed with other creatures, monsters mixed with monsters, monsters mixed with celebrities, whatever. Yeah, whatever happens to be, you know, the case. So we've done a chimeras episode before. It's true. Why are we doing another one? Because it's fun. It's just, yeah, it's fun. There's no other reason. Yeah. We wanted to do an episode. We want to do more monsters. You guys like monsters. Yeah. Everyone likes the feline horrors episode, for example. Yeah. So we're doing another one. Chimeras also are a great part of a fantasy game. Sure. And or, sci-fi. I was going to say, or a sci-fi game. Some horrid a things made in the lab. Steampunk game. Steampunk. Some alchemical chimeras, people. Yeah, I Think mean. Think about that. Let's face it. Mary Shelley, Frankenstein. Right, that is straight up steampunk. Mm -hmm. the, the first human chimera. Yeah. Made of all kinds of bits and pieces. Yeah. What else is good about what we're doing tonight? Well, great monsters. You just get to smash. Yeah, right? good just to thud. thud. Yeah. You want some creatures that your party can just murder hobo? These make great murder hobo creatures. Sure. They're decent big bads as well. Indeed, if they're smart enough. Yeah, yeah and many of them are often intelligent. A most appropriate reason is because chimeras are great for freaking out players. Oh, they excel at people going WTF. Yes. And I should say, the more your characters freak out at the description, the better. Absolutely. If you want to, if you play for the storytelling aspect like we do, you may not even say, hey, it's a chimera. Or no, it's this you monster. just describe You it. just describe this thing and they go, what the f*** am I looking at? Yep. And freak out. And then and it could be something, honestly, that won't kill the party. Yeah. It may be completely doable, innocuous, yeah. But if you describe it right, you instill a little bit of that horror. Their element. left eye starts twitching, and they're trying to figure out why their soul itches. It's why can't stuff. I recognize this thing? Yeah. It's because you homebrewed it, guys. That's yeah. why. In addition... It's a great way to provide story options and to beef up your world lore. Mm -hmm. So if you're building your own world or you're adapting something from a published material, this is a great addition to your game, straight up. Yeah, like a green whale with tree stride. Yeah, a green whale with tree stride. Think about that, guys. And in addition, they're just really easy to make. They really are. I mean, grab some animals, mash them together. You want to go even crazier? Grab some bigger animals or some monstrous animals, mash them together. Mash objects and monsters together. Mash horrible things together. It doesn't even, it can be two, it can be three. It doesn't matter. That's how it works. Yeah. And this works super well for any set. Pat and Oswald, a roll up desk, and three chimpanzees in a rowboat. Oh my God. It's, it's Pat and Oswald. Mm hmm. Three chimpanzees. Mm hmm. A rowboat and a roll-up desk. A roll. Okay, so it is a walking producer. <laughs> it just it just spits out script material for actors. Sure. And it's and it's huggable because Pat Oswalt is kind of nice. Yeah. 
do not try to hug the chimpanzee. If don't you hug do the, chimpanzee, the chimpanzee. chimpanzee. They're, they're not nice. They just look cute. All right. Now, for this episode, we have given ourselves a couple of qualifications because we're not just going to mash anything up. I mean, we did, but, but we do have some qualifiers. Uh, what are those, Matt? So, theoretically, we've got... <laughs> Must combine at least three creatures. Okay, so at least three creatures. So right. not two or one or whatnot. Right. Which I only vaguely stuck to to begin with. So that's, we're, that's, yeah, that's fine. Everything's flexible. It's great. So it's got to have a name. Yeah. And it's got to have a basic descriptor. Okay. We've got some rough stats, some special defenses and attacks. Just to kind of give you guys an ability, what you might want to throw into your game. Again, we don't know what you're playing. Right. It might be D and D. Probably is D and D. Could be Pathfinder. Could be some kind. It could be Travelers. Could be Shadowrun. Could be anything. Yeah. I've got at least one that works for a, a cyber style world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some ecology or story behind its creation because not everything that's created is going to have an ecology, and not everything that that's, has an ecology was created. That's very true. So we have what six, seven. I think we now have seven because seven, oh, your yeah. brain went off the rails. My brain, yeah. We, we got an insane one at the end. That's fine. So we're going to give you these delightful creatures. These are for use for whatever game you like. Just feel free to mod them. And if you do illustrate, please, we would love to see the illustrations of these horrible creatures. Absolutely. I would love to see particularly the first one. That would be cool. It would be very cool. And the last one. <laughs> in a couple of years too but I, mean, I don't know that I want to see the last no, one it's going to be great I can't wait to, to tell you guys about that we'll have to, you'll have to skip to the end of the episode for that alright what do we have first Matt the dreaded Mothagator ah yes and I should add we should probably say what we've created these what, we, what animals we've mashed these together with and so the dreaded Mothagator is a moth, a scorpion, and an alligator naturally Mothigator. Yeah. All right. The description goes as follows. As the moon casts its pale glow over the bayou, you see a fluttering of insects in the distance. A trail of fine white dust follows the small fluttering creatures as they move through the air in a lazy and spellbounding pattern. As the creatures get closer, you make out beautiful moth-winged moon-silver reptiles with a needle-point tail. You don't notice the sting as you're too fascinated by their beauty, and thanks to the venom, you never feel a thing as a thousand tiny mouths begin to feed. (laughs) Yeah, that doesn't sound awful at all. So, I want you to picture in your head Mm -hmm. a tiny, moth-sized, moon-silver alligator. Sure. with With a scorpion tail. They're beautiful. Iridescent eyes. They kind of, you know what, if you guys have seen like the pictures of fairy dragons and stuff like that in D&D. Yeah. Kind of, you know how yeah. they're kind of iridescent? Yeah, like the pseudo dragons. Yeah. yeah, so sort of like that, but it's a, it's it's clearly an alligator body. Oh, yeah. It's only, it's only, but it's only this big, but it's damn impressive because it's got a scorpion tail and can fascinate. All right, so we got some special stats, defenses, and attacks. Yep. Uh, the dreaded mothigator attacks as a swarm, so it's a swarm of these things. Sure. And first they fascinate, then they devour hapless victims. So we've got fascinating dust. So they leave a trail of dust. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that you would need to make a will save if you're playing D&D or Christmas save. I think if you're playing some other options, whatever the save happens to be. But basically right. you become fascinated by the dust. As you're mesmerized, then they kind of enter your space, and sting you. And that sting paralyzes. That's why you don't feel anything. Right. And then they have tiny teeth. Which chew you to death. Yes. Just and like driver roll, ants. They, yeah. Croc will roll you around till you stop kicking. <laughs> well, Crocodile Dundee there. Yeah. You know, like driver ants, like just strip a whole elephant clean within a couple of hours. Yeah, or... like tiny little reptilian piranha. Yep. Delightful. <laughs> Sounds lovely. I think it is. So what are the ecologies of these? Oh, there's no ecology. This is a wizard's nightmare fuel. Literally a, a wish gone wrong. Okay. The story goes as follows. Rogan the Unlucky, a dark wizard of ill repute with a habit of consorting with evil dragons, is said to be the creator of these horrors. After trying and failing to get 
Acidimidasis, an ancient black dragon, to destroy a nearby town, Rogan decided he'd just straight up create his own black dragon. Okay. He was trying to basically ally himself with evil dragons. Sure. They don't have nothing to do with them. Right. He's like, well, screw it. I'll make my own. Like you do. Yeah. Using a mighty ritual during a full moon, he expected a giant venomous alligator terrors. What he got was something far worse. So he's expecting large, right. monstrous, flying, dragon-looking alligators. Sure. It didn't work. Because unbeknownst to Rogan, a nearby bog fay was amused by his attempts and assisted with his spell work. The result being the dreaded mothigator. Assisted. Yeah. With quotation marks. <laughs> Added a few yeah. things here, yeah, yeah, yeah. a few things there. A little column A, a little column B. Next thing you know, you got a swimmer of mothigators. Sure. No one knows how to undo his creation as his notes and Rogan were immediately consumed by the first swarm he created. I mean, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. There you go. Feel free to use that in your campaign. How delightful. Indeed. All right. You have an interesting flying creature, which I must add, I also created a wind and storm creature, but we'll get to yours first. You have the cloud whale. Indeed. Now, I would like to point out, as usual, we have tiny little crossovers. Sometimes they're very large, but in this case, we have little crossovers. Now, when we do custom spells and custom critters, we do those in separate locations. I do them while I'm at work. He does them while he's at work or doing other things. This is just how long we've known each other and how much on a wavelength we happen to be. Our, our brains are in sync when we're creating these ridiculous things. All right, so first off, what is the uh, cloud whale created from? A whale. Okay. A baleen whale, specifically. Mm -hmm. And a tempest elemental. Okay. I got to shortcut the three creature requirement because a tempest elemental is two elementals combined. Which is air and... Water. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was one of those ones where I was just like, hmm, I forgot about the three requirement because we do these separately. It's fine. And it's, again, you got it anyway. Yep. As for the description, it goes a little something like, often mistaken for large storm fronts, these vaguely whale-shaped creatures are several miles wide and four to five times that in length. They're big. Yeah. They're real big. Megafauna. Yeah, no kidding. Their underbellies appear for all intents and purposes to be a storm cloud, despite being lower in the sky than one might normally expect. That includes rain and lightning. The tops of cloud whales are rubbery skin that is several feet thick, resistant to damage, and while not truly insensate, it has a very low sense of either pain or pressure. And it's for that reason that it's not uncommon for aerial creatures, skyship captains, or adventurers capable of group flight have been known to use the top of such creatures as either Ares for, you know, flying creatures, mm -hmm. storage, or mobile bases of operation. This would be cool to, I, I was thinking, I've got my own airship tower yeah. on top of a cloud whale. Sure, because they're enormous. Yeah, and, you know, if you're in a desert, fly it over. Got some rain. I got a new business now. Cool. So you've got this, what is it, several miles long? Yes. I mean, you could literally have an entire country on one of these things. A city. We've got this giant cloud yep. whale. Several miles in width. Throw an entire city on top of it. Absolutely. What's its special attacks or defenses or, uh, you know, some basic stats that we would expect? For size, I just put... Colossal plus. Yeah. It's just big. Yep. If it falls on you. I, is, I actually it, get to that. Okay. Because it is part cloud. It is part cloud. So you are mostly dead. Okay. The special attacks. Mm -hmm. Lightning. Yep. Flash flooding. Oh, that's cool. Special defenses. It has a metric ass ton of health as you might expect because it's bleeding enormous mm -hmm. it is resistant to most damage 
And what's the benefit of killing it? A lot of blubber. A lot of stormy, stormy blubber. Storm blubber. Storm blubber. But I mean, you could just harvest that a little bit at a time. It's, it doesn't feel very well. This would be really cool for like a water world. Oh, that might be cool, yeah. Where there's no land masses, everybody lives on cloud wells. Oh, that would be fun. Something to think well, about, folks. Yeah, we might have to run that. Yeah, we, we should run that. All right, cool. What's the ecology of the cloud whale? Cloud whales are filter feeders. They eat pollen. Smaller ones have been observed, leading experts to believe that these creatures do breed in some way. And due to their size, they're often solitary. They will occasionally travel in small pods, especially if a young one is present. Next, though, next we have the Kulaka Raptor. Yeah, Kulaka Raptor. The Kulaka Raptor. All right. Like chocolate, Kulak. Kulaka Raptor. So it's a, it's a raptor in Kulats? It is a cockatrice, a modron, and a velociraptor. Uh huh. <laughs> this is how my brain works. I know, man. I know. You know, I, go, I like yeah. alliteration and fun words too. So, what's the description on uh, this thing? From the open sky, this coppery mechanical avian comes out of nowhere with a whirring and buzzing of gears. Sure. Just kind of flies like Bubo from Clash of the Titans. Does it? Uh, does it also have the propeller that some of the motors? Oh yeah, have? it should totally have a propeller on it, or maybe some jet engine wings. Whatever you know, whatever works. Yeah. Like. Go, go crazy with that if you guys want. Uh, a large, shiny comb. Uh, not the one you do your like hair a with. Like, like yeah. a cock's comb. Like a cock's comb, yeah. Uh, a large, shiny comb adorns the creature's head like a rooster, and as it opens its beak, tiny teeth drip a strange alchemical substance. Okay. Like acid or yeah. something else. The monster's feet sprout large razor talons, and it whips a long club-like tail about with a menacing motion. Like you do. Like, like a Velociraptor. Yeah. And that is the Kalakaraptor. Uh, special defenses, attacks, and so forth. It is a clockwork creature for one. Mm-hmm. It is a petrifying clockwork flying Velociraptor. Right. What size is this thing? I need to know because I know what size people think Velociraptors are, and I know what size they actually were. I was going medium-sized creature with this okay. thing, honestly. So, movie Velociraptor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clever girl. Yeah. <laughs> Clever cockwork paralyzing girl. All right. So, it is a clockwork, petrifying, flying Velociraptor, medium sure. size. And as such, here are a few special attacks and defenses that we have. Now, obviously, you can peck it to death, you know, because it's got like a beak. It's got a horny beak. And it has slashing with its razor talons, but... We're talking more of the special stuff. Defense-wise, sure. it has a clockwork body. It can only be damaged by chaotic-aligned weapons. Okay. Your average magical weapon ain't going to do nothing to it unless it's chaotic. It's from Mechanus. Sure. I should note. We'll get to the, yeah. the story behind that and stuff. Mechanical stasis. This is the cockatrice portion of the program. Its bite slowly turns the victim's body into the same grayish metal which composes the cogs of Mechanus. So it turns you into cog metal. Nice. That happens to be in your game. It's got an aerial dive. If the creature succeeds in a dive attack, it automatically does maximum damage. No roll. Because it's it's axiomatic, so I mean it max it auto it knows how to do it. The maximum amount of damage from an aerial dive. I would just say it's because it's literally at that point just a giant bullet of metal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a big bullet <laughs> that petrifies you, turns you and slashes you apart. It's it's like a war it's like a giant Ginsu blender. Be fun. All right. I should have done that. And if it has a propeller, then that even it more explains it. Flying it Ginsu just... blender, yeah. Mm-hmm. It also has pack instincts finally. So should two or more Kalakaraptors hunt together. They automatically coordinate their attacks, and one is aware of the other. And whatever one knows, the others know as well. Gotcha. That's awful. And velociraptors do hunt in packs, or yes, did? Yes, they do. Yeah. They, I'm sure they still do somewhere. Somewhere, in some planet, in some multiverse, they're still kicking. Some rich guy's farm somewhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
It's just a matter of time. I can't wait. I want to hunt velociraptors. It'd be awesome. I, actually, I don't want to hunt I want to let them out. I want to ride velociraptors. That's what I want. You can have your velociraptor. I know. You want your ankylosaurus. Yes. I understand. It's got ankylosaurus love. It's a clockwork creature, but I'm going to ask anyway. What's the ecology of this beastie? Actually has one. Colocoraptors are native to several cogs in Mechanus, often preying upon rogue Modrons, Formians, which are the ant people, mm -hmm. and particularly planar travelers. Sure. Eats planar travelers. After several quick bites, the Colocoraptor is sated. Just takes a couple bites. Right. Leaving the rest of the unfortunate victim to turn into metal and bond with the planar gear. As such, many believe Colocoraptors are the natural healing mechanisms by which older worn gears repair themselves. Although, no one has studied these dangerous denizens long enough to see a gear repair in action. <laughs> I feel like there has to be a middle step there. Ah, there might be. Who cares? <laughs> it's, you know, all, all, you're going to be part of the cog, buddy. It doesn't really matter. Now, as far as the story goes, according to many sages, Primus created the Colocoraptor to assist with maintaining the clockwork nature of Mechanus and keeping it free of parasites, i.e., in this case, not anything naturally part of Mechanus. So. Right. Planar travelers, for example. Sure. Enterprising or crazy summoners can learn the ritual to bring a Colocoraptor to the Prime, where they find it to be able to be given orders, first off, so it is smart. Sure. Which it carries out to the letter, like a... Modron. Yeah, like a Modron. Yes. Yeah. However, bites from the Colocoraptor when summoned do not create Mechanus metal, but whatever the most common metal for that plane happens to be. Boo. <laughs> yeah, no. You can't get away with just summoning the damn thing and have, I've got some metal from Mechanus. It's axiomatic. Axiomatic weapons everywhere. Too bad, yep. buddy. Yeah, you <laughs> screwed up on that. I, I thought ahead of that. But that is the Colocoraptor, a flying, ginsuing, whirling death machine that turns you into metal. With, in my head, an Inspector Gadget propeller. Yeah. I would be fine with that as well. Just flying around. Mm -hmm. All right. We got four more awesome chimeras, but we'll be right back. After these messages. You with the face. Do you like what we have to say? Help our channel rise from the depths like the mighty Godzilla. Please like and subscribe and ring the bell and do all of the necessary YouTube. What he said. If there are any topics you would like us to cover, goods or services you would like us to review, or if you would like to sponsor an episode, we would love for you to contact us at info at goblinscorner.com. See you there. And we're back. Welcome back. So we're talking Chimeras Part 2. Indeed. Flying monstrosities. Such monstrosities. Yeah, we're giving you some ridiculous creatures already, so we've got... The dreaded Mothigator. Indeed. We've got uh, Cloud Whale. Mm -hmm. And the Colocoraptor. Because <laughs> you need one of those. You love that, know. don't you? Absolutely. That's great. And we're going to jump in. we got four more as well. And you have the Murder Crow. Indeed. Now, when I read this, I thought, a murder of crows? How do you work this out? But it's not. It's no. It's actually a the, murder crow. A murder crow. So tell me a bit about this Murder Crow. First off, what is it made of? It's made of a crow, a bionoid, which is not the bionoids from second edition Spelljammer, I think. Mm -hmm. What I was thinking was a biological android. Okay. A created, a, a, a biological AI. Also, it's got a little bit of poison dart tree frog in there and a little bit of rattlesnake thrown in there. So- Venomous creatures. Yeah, venomous and poisonous. Mm. That's important. Both. Okay. So toxic creatures, a bionoid, and a crow. Yes. Awesome. What's the description? Well, the thing is, is great care has been taken to ensure the differences between these and normal crows are nearly impossible to spot. By the time someone does realize it, it's probably a little late for that. It looks like a crow. It does indeed. Just straight like, up like a straight crow. Straight up crow until it just until murders it stops you. acting like a crow and murders you. Oh, that sucks. All right. Cool. What are the abilities of the murder crow? Well, first off, it's tiny. It's crow size. 
Okay. Although, you know, crows vary in size a good bit. It's true. Tiny, tiny's a, a rough word for them. All right. So tiny crow. Right. Cool. They have boosted intelligence. Which is hideous to behold because crows are pretty smart anyway. Yes. They have boosted endurance. Okay. Boosted agility. Mm-hmm. Because they're assassins. And then we come to the special attacks. They're poisonous. Like you do. Right. They're venomous. And they have a second mind that has been placed in their head. So that that's going to make them very resistant to things like charm and fear and things that you might use against an animal that you just wanted to get rid of. I'm seeing a typical looking crow with kind of an evil bend to its fist. You know, like when it kind of cocks its eye and looks at you, it's a little bit more, you know. Arr. Right, but. But you, but it looks like a crow. And you, you may not be like, you know what? No big deal. Crow flies in. Uh, maybe he, he picks the lock to your house, comes in. That was exactly. You go to bed, the crow's in your bedroom. What's going on with this crow? Ah, it's just a bird. And so you. You know, you, you catch it, you toss it out, you know, rah, it flies away, and you close the door, and you wake up in the middle of the night to scratching, and you wake up, and he's at your pillow, and he stabs you to death with a, the knife he found in your kitchen. <laughs> or with his venomous beak. Or with his venomous beak. Because you've been paralyzed, because you threw him out, and he's poisonous to the touch. Oh, well, oh, poison dart frog, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you throw him out, you fall to the ground like Karari. <laughs> And he's just gutting you. That's devious. I love this. Okay, cool. What's the ecology? I'm assuming it's... They're not- cloned and created in a lab. Yeah. yeah so they're man-made. Cool. Now, I don't know if... I, I hadn't decided whether or not they could breed with other crows or what would happen in the... No, they couldn't because they're poisonous. Mm-hmm. They'd kill other crows. Yeah. So... Are yeah. they immune to their own toxins? Uh, they're immune to theirs. But not... I don't know. Do poison dart frogs poison each other? No. In that case, yes. Because so where the you could comes breed from. them. They could, unless they're sterile. Yes. You could have an entire swarm or a murder of murder crows. I mean, life finds a way. It would be called a massacre of murder crows at that point. Yeah. I agree. I'm I'm good with that. <laughs> What's the story behind these murder crows? Some nut job bio doctor mm-hmm. working for. An unnamed mega corporation. Pick your setting. Right? Okay. Pick your corp. Doesn't matter. Thought it would be a blast to make sure that a murder of crows could live up to their name. They pitched the idea to their boss, half as a joke, because who really needs more dangerous crows? How many crows do you need? As many as I can fit. <laughs> so, In a suitcase. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> The boss looks the doc in the face and tells him to build a biological-based AI to put in the back of its head so that they can train it on who needs to be safe and who doesn't and how best to use their abilities that they're going to give it. Also, you have to have a viable specimen by the end of the second quarter next year or we're doing an audit on all of your past spending and experimentation. All right. Because anybody who comes up with murder crows definitely has spotty, questionable decisions in their spending and experimentation. It's a bit strange to me, certainly. <laughs> All right, that's a, that's a murder crow, huh? Yeah. Biological created monstrosity. Love it. Now we're going to go in a wildly different direction. <laughs> we're going to do one of mine. Indeed. So tell me about the sea tyrant. Ah, the sea tyrant. Coming on you from the open waves. So what's it made out of? All right, well, first off, it's a kraken. Mm Mm-hmm. Actually, several kraken. Sure. A thunderbird. Mm Mm-hmm. And a sea cucumber. Naturally. Now, when I came up with this, I wanted to see a majestically flying sea cucumber. Okay. And then it just got more horrible as I thought of this. Okay. This is the total party kill. This thing is awful. Let us show you the description, shall we? This destroys cities, not yeah. parties. Yeah, it's badass. I love this thing. 
The open waters your ship moves through suddenly becomes choppy, and a large thunderhead appears directly overhead of your vessel. A massive wave surges, releasing a gargantuan, bloated, cylindrical creature into the air, such as a flying sea cucumber. Sure. Its thick wings stir up several water spouts, and lightning leaps from its body to the clouds above. Yeah? Yeah, it's going to be awesome. The creature banks and faces you, opening its sphincter-like mouth and retching tons of flailing, hooked tentacles into the ship, which are connected you know, back to the creature. Yeah. You look upon the scene in horror as these tentacles are actually giant interconnected squid, such as Kraken. As the tentacles crush your galleon into kindling, the bloated flying sausage falls from the sky, smashing into the boat and dragging everyone to an electrified and watery grave. Like you do. <laughs> and I can kind of just see it arcing its cucumber back as it slams oh, sure. into the ship. Majestically. Yeah, majestic. Such a majestic creature. Just like murder Oreos, man. <laughs> Yep, so that's what I got there. All right. What are the stat special defenses and attacks on this monstrosity? The Sea Tyrant is a massive evil force of elemental destruction. You love that, don't you? I do. That's fantastic. (laughs) The following attacks and abilities are something that I've suggested, okay? So first off, it's a gargantuan creature. It's size. It's just huge. It just crushes everything in its wake. Uh, its blubbery body resists all physical damage. Yeah. You gotta have magical objects to pierce this thing. Sure. Its hide's just too thick. Can't get it. Uh, oceans and air can call up hurricanes, water spouts, can change the weather, call lightning, and these are both derived from either the Kraken creatures in D&D, which can call thunderstorms and call yeah. lightning, or the Thunderbird, which can shoot lightning. Real, Real lightning. lightning. Yeah, I, yeah. Got you on that. Blind sense 600 feet in the water, because... Sure. You know, sea cucumbers, sea cucumbers don't, yeah. they don't have eyes. Uh, 60 feet outside. So it's got blind sense. Now, interestingly enough, if it vomits the Kraken, the Kraken still have eyes, so they can see you. Sure. So if it throws its stomach out, then it can view creatures. Something to think about. Uh, speaking of which, it can vomit 1d4 Kraken. Uh-huh. The creatures attach. Yeah. That's actually its stomach. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've got to ask... Kraken, if I remember correctly, have spell casting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm I'm good with that. It's a creature that has one d four Kraken as its gullet. Yeah. And oh, and and finally, the thing's intelligent. Because what it has to be. Yeah. Because otherwise, the Kraken would just tear it to pieces. That is absolutely true. Something has got to be very intelligent and super powerful to prevent Kraken from destroying each other. Mm-hmm. And that is this thing. Sounds awful. What's the ecology of this? Well, there's no ecology to this, okay. specifically. Uh, sea tyrants are hateful beings and are only released when Umberly is truly displeased. Umberly is the goddess of the ocean in the Forgotten Realms. Yeah. So, so this is a Kraken not in... In the mythological sense, not in the common monster manual sense. Yeah, right? this it is, is a, the creature. It that... is a titanic creature that is kept locked away until it is time to just absolutely wreck. One hundred percent. This is definitely something that you would release upon the world as an elder evil, perhaps. Maybe not. Maybe not on that scale, but certainly close enough. It's definitely a, a high level campaign type thing if you're going to fight this thing. Yeah, I mean. It would literally destroy most port cities. Yes. Now, the story of its creation goes as follows. Believed to be the dreams of Umberly, the evil goddess of the ocean, the sea tyrant visits its wrath upon vessels, islands, and even coastal nations whose actions have displeased her. Sure. Seemed pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. While Umberly maintains control of this titanic creature, it occasionally breaks free from its watery prison to stay as Months of terror and violence. Gotta eat. It's, yeah, occasionally Cucumber gotta eat, man. Gets out of its hot, you know, gets out of its prison occasionally, just screws everything up. Now, thankfully, there's only ever been one sighted at an occurrence, much like the Tarasque. But it's possible more lie in wait for the time of a watery Armageddon. I like to think that Umberly 
exercises her imagination. Like, there's only one of these. Mm hmm. But there's more creatures but there, similar yes. of horror. I would, I would yeah. be down with that too. There's a tardigrade in there somewhere. Oh, a, giga- a, a titanic tardigrade. The titanic turtle terrasque tardigrade. There you go. Tardigrade, terrasque, and a sea turtle. It's not flying. Dragon turtle. A dragon turtle. Yes. All right. That's even better. Now there's four chimeras. Because it, it needed a breath weapon. It needs a breath weapon. Sure. So that's your, uh, that's your sea tyrant. Scourge of the, of the inner sea. Can you imagine? Okay. So basically this thing with lightning bolt wings just flumps up into the air. Mm-hmm. Right? Because it doesn't look bad until it throws its stomach at you. It just looks like this ridiculous... <laughs> it's blubbery, cylindrical object with right. wings. And then all of a sudden, that noise, because there has to be a noise. Hard retching as its innards just empty itself onto the galleon, and it turns out that... The, it, that its innards... Are cracking. Are cracking. Yes. Now, I almost made a traducan and had it the Kraken vomit other creatures, but I thought that would be too much. But if you want to go that extra mile, folks, it vomits 1d4 Kraken, which in turn vomit 1d4... Colossal squid. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah. Oh, it'd be awful. That'd be, yeah, it just pulls everything in. How many tentacles is that? You know what? It's too many. That's, That's too many. many. That's, That's that, even a... So many. Yeah, even a hente anime can't contain all the tentacle horror in that. Although I would say it would be really easy to go ahead and collect all the food when you've got that many tentacles, right? You just... It's like a fisherman's net, net, man. just grabs everything. All right. We're getting out of hand here. Let's talk about your next creature, the Glisterling. Okay. What What is it made of, first off? It's made of joy and light and happiness. Oh, that sounds awful. It's a lie. It's so imagine what would happen if you mixed a pixie with a will o' wisp. Hey, listen, <laughs> it'd be the thing from Legend of Zelda. Very similar, in fact. Awesome. All right, so you've made a Legend of Zelda marker. All right, cool. <laughs> so ridiculous. Give me the description. Okay. In the deep forests and even deeper bogs, life can be dangerous even for a pixie. Some few pixies have the depth of mischievousness that will carry them past even their immortal lives into a form of undeath known only to the fae. Mm -hmm. Glisterlings have insubstantial bodies of iridescent light and beautiful butterfly wings of green and gold. Hmm. In a similar manner to some ghosts that are trapped in the emotional state that they died in and possibly even animated by it, so too are glisterlings trapped in a permanent state of mischief, which is to say, not a a lot actually changed for them. Yeah, because they're just so they're basically undead mischievous creatures. Yeah, combined with a undead mischievous creature. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So a chimera of two undead. Very cool. All right. What? Uh. Well, obviously, it's, I'm assuming it's a small or tiny creature. Yes. Okay. What kind of attacks or special defenses does it have aside okay. from being light right it's small it's very small very small uh it can only be affected by magical weapons or it's resistant to anything that's non-magical because well it's made out of light now pixies are invisible yes in certain games and in certain editions the answer to that is yes okay and more recent editions they are not they are not ah okay less dangerous what else can it do flit that allows them to move at triple their speed as an action. Nice. So instead of, you know, if you're playing Pathfinder or D&D and you, you get like a movement mm-hmm. and then an action, well, that action can be at triple speed if they so choose. Okay. Spell access. Let's talk about this. They have access to all druid cantrips. All illusion, enchantment, and necromancy cantrips. Interesting. Now, keep in mind, they're mischievous, right? So they're not 
out here just blasting wildly, they're going to be using these for their own amusement. To really wreck your day. Yes. Okay. They also have access to all of those for first and second level spells. So all first, second, and cantrips for Druid, Illusion, Enchantment, and Necromancy? Yes. Ooh. All right. We got Charm Person. We've got Told the Dead. Yeah, that's pretty much all you need, really. This... Minor Illusions. Yeah, silent all, the, all the Illusion spells. I'm well aware of those. Okay, yeah. So you can, you can pit trap everybody. They also know the location to the nearest entrance to the Feywild, and generally speaking, love to bring people to it. Because it's a will-o'-the-wisp. Exactly. So instead of bringing them to bogs, they bring them to the Feywild portals. However, this would be an awesome way to get your character to the Feywild. Yes. If you just want... You know, instead of like the hand of the DM going, hey, you turned a corner and now you're in the Feywild or you slept in a ring of toadstools, which the characters would be like, screw that. I wouldn't want to go to Feywild. They follow a will of the wisp to, to murder it, ostensibly. Or but it's not a will of the wisp, right? It's got beautiful butterfly wings. Yeah, what is this it? gorgeous yeah, yeah, thing? What is this thing? I'm going to follow it and try to murder it because I'm a murder hobo. <laughs> Next thing you know, hey there, buddy, you're in the you're in the Feywild. <laughs> now you're about to learn exactly how horrible things are. It flits around and leaves. Because it can, because it's a fey. Yep. Meanwhile. You're, you're making you're making all the, uh, what is it, the, the goblin bargains and stuff to try to get out? <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. You sell your first dream just to get access to the hedge, playing Changeling or something like yep. that. Didn't say it had to be D&D, folks. That's true. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's the, uh, the Glisterling. Indeed. So, I'm going to try it. I'm going to give it a shot. We have come to the final Chimera. Mm-hmm. You ready? Here we go. The Flocka Rocka Waka Flocka. You got it right on Boom. the money, man. First try. Flocka Rocka Waka Flocka. Okay. Just <laughs> sure. You know how I love alliteration. I do. So, sure. What's it made out of, man? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Make it happen. It is the lead singer of the Flocka Seagulls. Okay. The Rock. Uh-huh. And Waka Flocka, the rapper. Uh-huh. <laughs> I wanted a, a true chimera. So it is a chimera with the heads of those three musicians. Okay, so what's the rest of the description? All right. At the peak of the summit, you see a strange creature composed of an eagle front, lion back, and a snake tail. Very typical chimera. Sure. Three human heads gaze at you and prepare to sing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so what are the... So it's a chimera with... Three celebrity faces. Yes. Okay. How delightful. And, and this can be sci-fi, fantasy, other. Horror. Eh, definitely horror. <laughs> this could totally be like a nightmare dream horror game. Oh, yeah. But I was also thinking a, a uh, super sci-fi, you go to like another planet or something like that, and these guys are there because maybe it's in the future and they got cloned. Yeah, like a Psychonauts dream sequence would Psychonauts. also would be. Oh, totally Psychonauts for this, yes. I miss that game. All right, what are the stats, special defenses, and attacks? The Flocka Rocka Waka Flocka has three bite attacks, so it's three heads, mm-hmm. and it's got a snake tail, so it can bite you. So it's got poison. Okay. Yeah. Like that. Uh, the first head, Mike Score, the head, and that's the lead singer of the Flocka Seagulls for you kids. Don't know who that is. Casts a wave of confusion. Why a wave? Because it's new wave music, guys. Sure, man. <laughs> sure thing. The the head of the rock. The rock the rock has the rock's uncontrollable hideous flexing, thirty foot cone. It's just like Tasha's uncontrollable hideous laughter, except the victim must flex their physique to all within sight. They also lose all body hair. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now So all your body the- hair falls off and you majestically flex while you're confused by uh Mike Score. Sure. One of the things that I would require for this particular head Mm -hmm. is a secondary save. The secondary save... To smell what he's cooking? ...is a constitution save to see how sore you are. Oh, from flexing? From flexing. Because if you're the mage with, like, six strength, and you've failed this role 
several times. You can't run away. You're just like, oh my God. I'm totally going to put that in there. Yes, absolutely. And finally, the walk a flock ahead does flame naturally. Yeah. Walk a flock of flame, of course. Yeah. Is it a flaming headbutt or a flaming uh, breeze, cone breath? Breeze, okay. breeze a cone of flame. Okay. Walk a flock of flame. No. No, it's not a cone. A line. It's got to be a line. Yeah, it's a line of fire. fire. I agree with that as well. Yeah. It spits fire. All right. What's the ecology? The, the flocka rocka waka flocka ranges anywhere where music is appreciated or despised and seeks an audience by which it can sing, which is, uh, by the way, a combined song of I Ran So Far Away by Flock of Seagulls, mm -hmm. You're Welcome from Moana by The Rock, and No Hands by Waka Flocka. <laughs> So it mashes all three of those into a mix-up. All right. <laughs> Should the victims not enjoy the mashup, the creature attacks. Okay. And Guaranteed they most likely will not enjoy the mashup. <laughs> so. I can't help myself. Two things here. Firstly, for any of you who are musically inclined, I want you to make this mashup work. I don't just want you to make it. Mm -hmm. I want you to make it work. I ran so far away by Flock of Seagulls. Uh -huh. You're welcome from the Moana soundtrack by The Rock. Uh -huh. And No Hands from Waka Flocka. Think about that. Okay. If you can make that work. Props. You know what? You make that work, send it to me, eric at goblinscorn.com or matt at goblinscorn.com. I'll send you a t-shirt. Absolutely. First person that does this, you get a t-shirt. So yep. Just send it to me. Give me your address. You got it. And as for the story. We'll design it. We'll let's just, yeah, let's we'll, design them a t-shirt. We yeah, we'll make you a t-shirt. They deserve that. You get one for that. I'll put this thing on. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I'll design the t-shirt with the walk -of the flocka rocka walka flocka. And if they if they send us a link to where their match up uh, their uh, mashup is posted, we'll stick it we'll on put the put that on the t-shirt. On the t-shirt? Sure. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Free advertising. Now, as far as the story, I didn't make one. I yeah. just wanted to make just, something ridiculous. You, you succeeded. There you go. <laughs> so there you have it. Seven completely amazing, horrifying, and as you heard from the last, ridiculous, ludicrous, yeah, yeah. ludicrous creatures for your campaign of various types. They're all flying monstrosities to scare your characters with or make them laugh. Yeah. I certainly laughed most of this episode. I'm sure. Did we miss something? Write to us. Info at goblinscorner.com, or you can reach me, Eric, at goblinscorner.com, or... Me, Matt, at goblinscorner.com. We're on all sorts of things. Matt, what are some things we're on? We're on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitch. As Goblins Corner. We're also on Instagram. As the Goblins Corner. It's true. Somebody was slick. Yeah. They slid in there. It is what it is. Or great minds think alike. Could be that. It's true. <laughs> if you like our show, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player, YouTube, and Twitch. Also, if you could, click those five stars, give us a review on iTunes, Podchaser, YouTube, Twitch, everything. Just give us a review everywhere, five stars everywhere. We appreciate it. It boosts our show, and it feeds the hungry algorithm. That's right. So that we can make more ridiculous animals and creatures for your games. Indeed. That's all the time we have for tonight. Once again, my name's Eric. And I'm Matt. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks. The Goblin's Corner has been written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Music by D20. This is a subterranean production.